Thank you all for coming, everybody. Um, so I bribed my friends to come see me tonight by telling them that my speech will be the sexiest thing they'll experience in their young adult lives. <laughs> but in fact, this won't be a particularly sexy speech. It's just false marketing. Um, sorry, but I've gotten you all this far, so I might as well keep going. Um, this is a speech about science, and it's also about me and why science is important to me. And what I love about science is that it makes sense, even when nothing else seems to. One time I was sitting in the car with my grandma, and she told me she had a small piece of criticism she wanted to give me. Um, <laughs> due to my fragile self-esteem at the time, I thought she was going to say I was ugly or that I smelled bad. But instead, she told me that I was monotone, and I should start quitting asking questions. Um, <laughs> um, at the time, I took this with a grain of salt. My logic is that there are worse things than being monotone. I could be a psychopath or a politician. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the United States alone, there are 32 million illiterate adults, approximately 636,000 homeless people, and 10 million people who watch Glee. Let's be real here. <laughs> it could be worse. <laughs> Um, and I never did work on the tonal qualities of my voice, so you can imagine my grandma's horror when I told her I was going to give a talk in front of the United Nations last fall. 14,000 delegates from 193 countries, all of them listening to me, to my boring, dry, monotone voice go on and on and on. Good thing I had something interesting to say. Um, I was invited to speak at the UN Conference on Biological Diversity in Hyderabad, India, after a paper I wrote won the Citizen Science Paper Competition. It was a pretty big deal, and it was absolutely terrifying, but it was also very empowering. Here I was, um, a sophomore at the College of Charleston, talking to the United Nations about this idea I'd come up with that applied to something called quorum sensing to the coral reefs. More on that in a minute, because I know it doesn't make very much sense right now. But um, my point is, is that my idea landed me in a whole different country, a whole different world with a completely different um, set of people. And it was completely unfamiliar, but it wasn't exactly uncomfortable. I was used to feeling out of place, and I've always felt that way, or at least I've always known that I was somehow different. As a child, I couldn't eat most scenes because the textures were too overwhelming. I couldn't swim because the feel of water on my skin drove me crazy. I couldn't touch certain fabrics like velvet or towels because it was like fingers to a blackboard. And I wore the weirdest outfits. Thank God growing up my Catholic school required uniforms, otherwise I would have walked around looking like the crypt keeper and nobody would probably want to be my friend. Um, <laughs> um, I also told a lot of dirty jokes as a child that were very age inappropriate. And <laughs> um, I completely lacked a filter, and I remember when I was younger, my favorite comedian was George Carlin, as he mentioned previously, and it didn't sit well with my mom's boyfriend's in-laws when I met them for the first time. <laughs> and I still tell a lot of dirty jokes, but I like to think I'm more in control of the things that come out of my mouth. Um, seriously, though, I've always been a little different than my friends, and I've always been aware of that. It's not that after I thought something, it'd be like, oh, that was a weird thought, because none of it was weird for me, because that's how I felt, and it's what I knew, but it's always by, I could always tell that I was different from how other people reacted to me and the things I said. Um, and you see, I have Asperger's, and for some people that might sound like a disadvantage, like a weakness or a shortcoming, which means I have no social skills, or can't pick up on social cues, but for me, it's the opposite. It's a gift. It has given me opportunities I would have never otherwise had. It's why I can make the connections I do in science and think of things in ways that may have not been thought of before. An example of this is quorum sensing in coral reefs. Um, so all this la started last summer when I went to Bali, Indonesia with Phil Dustin, a biology professor here at the college, for a three-week course in tropical ecology. During some downtime, I was reading pharmacology and neuroscience journals, which are areas that I'm very passionate about. Um, and I came across this term called quorum sensing. Basically, quorum sensing is a process by which um, bacteria communicate with each other based on how much bacteria is, is in one area. 
And if you've all seen Avatar, you'll remember how all the plants are communicating with each other through non-scientific hippie life systems. But um, similarly, perhaps quorum sensing was what coral reefs used to communicate with each other um, through their bacterial communities, which are vital to their survival. And I came up with this idea that we could recreate quorum sensing in coral reefs in order to sustain their life and protect the overall reef biodiversity. And um, back in Charleston a month later, my brother told me about a competition for biological diversity research. In a week, I'd written the paper, came up with the idea, and submitted it to um, this competition on my idea with coral reefs and quorum sensing, and I ended up winning. And I never dreamed I would win, and I never dreamed that the scientific community would be so interested in this. I never dreamed my paper would be published in Columbia University's journals, and I definitely never dreamed I'd be presenting it in front of the UN. And maybe if I had, I would have taken my grandmother's criticism more seriously. <laughs> yeah. But, thank you. Mm -hmm. But there I was in India, speaking in front of thousands of people, monotone voice and all. And while I was there, I sat in on all the negotiations and I really got an idea of where this world is coming in terms of the environment. I got an idea of how far we really have to go, of how these countries who are considered leaders in sustainability don't have ideas that will actually work according to ideas in science. And I learned how the UN delegate delegates' minds work, and I learned that they are stuck in an old way of thinking. I know that's very rigid and critical of me to say, but oh well. Um, I learned that now more than ever, the world needs people who think differently. And if there's one thing I can get across in these eight minutes is that the world is in desperate need of creative and intellectual minds to solve complex problems. I am a living example of that. If we give those who think differently a chance, they can contribute things to this world beyond what we can imagine. For my part, I want to make a positive impact on our world and help people with neuropsychiatric and brain illnesses on a large scale level. And every day, I ask myself how I can accomplish these two goals. And every day, the answer is science. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.